Sundar Pichai, Satya Nadella, Parag Agarwal, Shantanu Narayan. These are just few of the many Indians who've managed to snap up top jobs at global tech companies. At the most recent count, 60 of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are of Indian origin. So what is it that makes Indians be accepted as leaders of global companies? Is it something as fundamental as education and managerial skills or more abstract factors like upbringing and value systems or the more mundane attributes like a willingness to relocate and the will to adapt swiftly to new environments. It's not just business. Even in the complex world of politics, we're seeing the rise of leaders with Indian roots, from Kamala Harris in the US to Rishi Sunak in the UK. Now, what does this trend mean for and to the Indian diaspora? Has India's progress and growth on the global stage helped push the acceptance of Indians at top global roles? These are just a few of the questions that we're asking today as we take stock of India at 75. And as part of the 2022 India's Fora Global Forum, a three-day event featuring business leaders, artists, philanthropists, and other prominent people of Indian origin who hail from across the globe. I'm joined today by two people who have, in fact, lived this trend. First, veteran banker Piyush Gupta, who currently serves as the CEO of DBS Group, born in Meerut and armed with a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from St. Stephen's College in Delhi and an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. He's also the vice chairman of the Institute of International Finance. He worked at Citi for over 20 years, becoming the CEO of Citi's operations in Southeast Asia, Australia and New Zealand before joining the DBS Group as its CEO in 2009. Also with us on today's show is Prem Batsa, the founder and chairman of Canada-based Fairfax Financial Holdings. This Padma Shri awardee from Hyderabad holds a degree in chemical engineering from IIT Madras and MBA from the University of Western Ontario. His success story at Fairfax involves the takeover of a small insurance company on the verge of bankruptcy and turning it into a giant with annual revenues of nearly $20 billion in 2020. My third guest this evening is no stranger to the travails of managing a global company and in the highly competitive competitive field of healthcare, no less. Shobhna Kamineni is the executive vice chairperson of the Apollo Hospitals. From hospitals to pharmacies to diagnostic centers to drug R&D, home care and telemedicine, the Apollo Group has a formidable and growing presence in almost every facet of healthcare, not just across India, but across Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Gentlemen and Shobhna, many thanks for joining us on this very special conversation. And I want to start with you, Prem Batsa. Uh, you know, we're talking about the rise of CEOs who are of Indian origin, 60, as we just pointed out at last count, heading Fortune 500 companies. Your story, in a way, is, uh, uh, is uh, you know, explains to us the distance that has been covered. Uh, born in Hyderabad, went to IIT Madras, and then you left India to go to Canada with $8 in your pocket. I believe your brother supported you. You did door-to-door uh, -door sales for an appliance maker for a while before you actually got started on your entrepreneurial journey. Explain to me what it took to leave India with $8 in your pocket and make it big in Canada. Farinda, uh, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be with all of you today, uh, with Piyush and Shobana and yourself, and uh, celebrating 75th year of uh, independence for India. Um, you know, my story is uh, very similar in North America. First of all, we as Indians have a huge, um, 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 you know, we have a huge uh, advantage because we are living, we came from a democracy. I was 22 years old. I left um, uh, India. Uh, I actually went to I am Ahmedabad, where Pierce went. And um, my dad said to me, you must go where your brother is. There's not a lot of opportunity in India. This is 1972. And, you know, I'm 22 years old and I would met my wife to be and um, but I listened to my dad. Best decision I did went to um, Canada, no money, but a good family. My father was a teacher. My father's uh, the values were very good. And that's a big plus of uh, Indians, I think, in the United States and the uh, rest of the world. Really good values and um, hard work, um, family oriented, treating people well. And so I went to Canada, did an MBA, um, I lived with my brother. See, my brother was about uh, 30 years old, I'm 22, and uh, he um, um, opened his house. Uh, he didn't have a lot of money either. And I stayed in a little, um, a little room. And, um, but Canada and the United States has massive opportunity, uh, um, uh, Shireen, and, um, and so um, I, you know, I was able to take advantage of it. And um, over 37 years now, 
um, I built um, a good company, good values. And I am so excited about what's happening in India because it's a similar opportunity set that's uh, coming with Mr. Modi. Well, you know, we'll talk about the India story in just a second. But what a fascinating story, Prem Vatsa, that you just shared with us and our viewers. Piyush Gupta, if I may address uh, the very same question with you. Very different stories, very different narratives. Here was Prem Vatsa who left with $8 in his pocket to try and make it big in Canada. You, of course, moved up the ranks of Citibank after spending 20 years there and then uh, moved to Singapore uh, and joined DBS Group in 2009. What do you believe... Uh, is the playbook that has enabled people like Prem Vatsa and you to make it to the top global jobs, to the top global positions. Prem talked about democratic values, uh, family-oriented values. He talked about the ability or the culture of keeping people at the heart of decision-making, uh, which is really how a lot of us have grown up with. What, to your mind, is the playbook that has enabled this success? So, Shireen, first of all, let me echo Prem's uh, words. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, on the show. The Soul Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav, 75 years of Indian independence, is actually uh, quite a cool thing. Uh, but, you know, to address your question specifically, it's quite clear. It's not, uh, uh, you know, one uh, size fits everybody. Prem said the best decision he made was not to go to I'm Ahmedabad. I have to tell you, the best decision I made was going to I'm Ahmedabad. So I guess, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, different strokes. But, uh, you know, when I when I look at um, all of the successful Indian diaspora and business, and as you were saying in your preface, in politics as well, uh, I want to point out two things just before we, you know, get too full of ourselves. One, the demographics are obviously in our favor. One-sixth mm -hmm. of the world's population is Indian. And therefore, it's not unexpected that a large number of Indians in the global uh, landscape wind up uh, doing well. Uh, the second big positive, uh, you could argue, you know, why there are more people from mainland China, and that's obviously the second big positive, this language. We all grew up speaking English, and in a world uh, where both business and politics is English-dominated, uh, uh, that's obviously a big help. But to me, both of these things, uh, you know, the knowledge of English and effectively large numbers of us who are coming through a very refined selection process, you know, get into IIT, get into, you know, the good schools, and therefore there's an automatic selection process, I think that has something to do with it. But if you park those two um, fundamentals aside, I really want to point to three things which in my experience have been particularly uh, uh, different about uh, uh, the Indian diaspora. The first bit up is really the sense of hunger. And I think some of that is attributed mm -hmm. not just to the value systems Prem talked about, but just to the fact that many of the Indians who were successful came from middle class Indian background. If you look at those 60 CEOs, you'll find how many of them came from uh, parents who were in the bureaucracy, civil service, teachers, professors, and therefore they grew up in India in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, where you really had to strive to succeed. And the sense of really being, uh, you didn't have a choice, you had to work extremely hard, it shaped a work ethic, which stood by Indians uh, across uh, the various pursuits around the world. Uh, the second, uh, I think, is the sense of adaptability. You know, it's so interesting, Shireen, a lot of people think that all Indians are similar. We're all brown skin and we all come from one part uh, of the world, South Asia. <laughs> In truth, all of us have grown up in a milieu where you deal with multiple different kinds of people, different languages, different religions, different ethnicities. I grew up playing soccer, football with people from all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds, from the driver's kids to well-off people, from young people to old people. That creates a sense of adaptability, which is extremely helpful. You can go into all kinds of situations and people, uh, whether it's French or German or English or East Asian or Chinese, and you adapt very quickly. Uh, so that's, that's extremely helpful. And the third thing I'd like to point out is this idea of tenacity. You come from a system where infrastructure doesn't work. And so, you know, this old jugaad, the Indian jugaad, you don't have a choice. You've got to be able to have the tenacity to be able to see things through. When I, uh, and, and, and in a strange way, apart from teaching you, you know, some interesting tricks, uh, what's interesting about that is that it teaches you, it's a great education. You know, I used to be um, chief of staff, and actually I, I worked with City for 27 years, well north of 20. I used to be chief of staff to the country manager in India, Aditya Puri, in those days. I used to work till 10, 11 at night. I got shifted to Singapore to do the same job for Asia. So a much bigger job, like, you know, uh, 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 multiples bigger. And I used to finish my work at 4 in the afternoon. I realized uh, after some time that what I thought was work in India was really failure demand. I was trying to make the elephant dance. I mean, you went overseas, the elephant dance, so you didn't have to put in all that effort. 
So for several years, I used to think, you know, everything in India is a waste, a lot of it. And then I realized it actually wasn't. It was a fantastic grounding and educational experience. You really learn when you have to make that elephant dance. You learn how you can make an elephant dance, and that's extremely helpful as well. So, sorry, long answer to your question, but to me, these things, I sometimes think of them as having the right hat. The hunger, the adaptability, and the tenacity, HAT. Those are really quite distinctive in my experience. Well, that, that's a nice way of what? putting it, hunger, tenacity, and adaptability. Uh, yes, Prem, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just said that, you know, what Piyush says is so right. When you leave, you know, we've all grown up in India, and then you leave, uh, it's such a big advantage. You develop qualities that you never had thought you had, and you, you haven't had. But as he says, teaching the elephant to dance or um, working hard and um, uh, with no limit. You've got only one way to go up because you're right at the bottom, right? And so um, it's a huge advantage. I've always told my children that I have a big advantage over them. I was an immigrant to Canada with no money. And okay. so uh, uh, you had to work very hard, figure out uh, how you could do well. And you learn qualities that you never thought you had. So I'm uh, just uh, uh, reinforcing what Piyush says. Well, you know, Shogna, your story is very different. In fact, it goes back to your father who decided he wanted to make the elephant dance, but from the inside uh, and, you know, set up Apollo Hospitals. And now today he's a global brand trying to address a global challenge and global needs. So, Shobna, to the points being made there by Piyush and Prem, I want to understand from you what your playbook looks like at this point in time as you now try and take Apollo uh, more and more global to cater to this massive global challenge of healthcare. Uh, thanks, Shireen. And uh, you're absolutely right. Like, uh, uh, my dad was the first one in his village uh, to come out and, and, you know, to do medicine, went to the U.S. Was, and, and it's not just him, but I think that we have to recognize that there are 30 million Indians like him that, you know, not only... Uh, hold up the NHS in England, but the U.S. healthcare system and uh, the IT and so many services in around the world are really driven by fantastic Indians, and I think that's a that's that, that's a huge global achieve, achievement. But my dad chose to come back, and and I think the story would have been very different if he had stayed in the U.S. Uh, and I think that so the only extra quality I'd like to add to both Prem and uh, Piyush is entrepreneurship. Indians have uh, this huge ability to take risk and, um, and this drive, this entrepreneurial drive. And I think that's something that, you know, uh, was what he thought that Indians needed better. And I think it was that in healthcare. And in doing so, we built this, this organization uh, that, that, you know, a premium organization at a price point that could actually benefit many, many geographies in the world. So while we turn around and we're creating healthcare professionals that are world-class and outcomes also in our hospitals, this is a model that I think is required uh, for the world as we're going to be seeing it. Uh, COVID has accelerated the digital trend, for instance, so, so we can deliver, you know, uh, we, we can deliver healthcare to almost every part of the world. Uh, it was about India, but, but there's nothing stopping us from giving telemedicine, teleradiology, and many of these facilities to the rest of the world. So I, uh, we truly believe, and what we are gearing up for is that the next revolution will, uh, that comes from India will not be export of services, will not just be IT purely driven, but will be healthcare. Um, intelligence and data and IT driven. And I think there's a huge opportunity in that. One is to serve it from India. The second is then I think we, that while India, of course, requires a huge number of healthcare professionals and there's, and there's a job opportunity, good paying jobs for the many Indians that come into the workforce. But we must also realize that these uh, that these uh, you know trained individuals and and especially the fact that you know that they're taught in English have an opportunity to be relevant in countries that have a deep shortage, especially now of healthcare workers. So I think that you know there's an opportunity for us to fill these gaps around the world 
and make India so much more relevant. So if you ask me, these are the two big things. And the last is the cost, the arbitrage, the cost for arbitrage of India continues to be there of great healthcare outcomes at a much lower price than the rest of the world. And now, as you see in the US in Canada and Australia and, and England, the large waiting, uh, the, the waiting time to get healthcare. And we're seeing actually right. a reverse where, where people are coming to India to have healthcare. So I think mm. that there's going to be a huge new uh, opportunity for healthcare for India to serve the world. Yes, uh, a lot of headroom for growth, and it could be an exportable model uh, that uh, we could benefit from. Uh, Shobhna, many thanks for sharing that with us. But Piyush, I want to come back and talk about the point that Shobhna was making about the role and relevance of India, specifically in a post-COVID world. We've seen an acceleration of some of the existing trends, whether it's digitization, which is clearly an advantage uh, for a country like India, uh, or you know the growth of uh, uh, supply chains and much more sort of uh, you know the disruption that we are seeing as far as supply chain resilience is concerned perhaps could also be uh, an advantage for India. I want to talk to you about a comment that you made that you truly believe that this is going to be Asia century and the role and relevance that you see India playing within that. Um, um, Shireen, um, I was trying to get a word in earlier. So let me just uh, quickly go back to something Shireen said uh, and I'm going to come back and answer a question. There's a place where I differ with uh, what Shobna, sorry, Shobna said, and there's uh, one thing which I differ with slightly, and that's the fact that Indians have generally always been entrepreneurs. I'm not sure that's actually necessarily right. Through the 70s and 80s, when I was growing up in India, our capacity to take risk was very limited. And therefore, most Indians chose to go into professional services and not go into entrepreneurship. Uh, and for the longest time, that's what we found, professional Indians, in fact, all the CEOs you talk about, all of them made their global mark, uh, joining multinationals and growing in the professional space. I think one of the good things, you know, the Marwadis were always great businessmen, so were, you know, some of the community, Sindhi, maybe Chetias, but these were pockets. So one of the big shifts that's happened in the last 10, 15 years is that this capacity to take risk has got kindled. And, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe it existed 100 years ago, but there's been a fundamental shift and change. The number of unicorns in India, the number of people willing to take that entrepreneurial step that's fundamentally changed. I think there's something to keep in mind. So, but to, to move on to the question you really were asking me, I honestly believe that for um, you know, important reasons, I do think that this is going to be the Asian century. I mean, demographics are generally in favor of Asia. Wealth is being created in Asia, rising consuming middle classes in countries like Vietnam and Indonesia and Thailand, not just India. Uh, so I do think we have a tailwind. But uh, the two uh, really important factors. One is, uh, I I think this uh, geopolitics and the tensions between the US and China are, for the first time in uh, 30 years, creating a discontinuity where, without doubt, the net incremental investment uh, for assembly line, manufacturing capacity, etc., uh, people are looking hard and thinking about where else they can place it. Uh, believe me, nobody's moving assembly lines out of China. The supply chain for technology is tough to move. But at the margin, the next assembly line or the next investment, people are definitely looking at a China plus one. Now, in that space, hmm. uh, there are only two or three countries who are attracting attention. Vietnam is, so is Malaysia. But India stands, uh, stands out. India has got this dramatic uh, opportunity to put those two million engineers, that massive education base, to work. And for the first time in a long time, I'm beginning to get optimistic about uh, India's capacity to do the Akhandra Bharat or the manufacturing capa uh, capacity we talked about. And you can see it not just in automobiles and automobile parts. There's a bunch of exports going out from India. You can see it in mobile phones. You can increasingly see it now in uh, a high-tech uh, electronic sector, semiconductor. I think this shift is going to be consequential. And if you can uh, keep you know, India's manufacturing sector up to 25 odd percent, uh, that will not only create more jobs, but it will change the texture of the Indian economy. I think this is a really useful and important time for India uh, in the days ahead. The other big thing, obviously, is consumption. And I've said this, uh, uh, digital consumption. Uh, you know, the world is changing. Today, 16% of global GDP is being consumed online. What that means is that if you are digitally inclined, the world is your marketplace. And for India, which is digitally inclined, you have the capacity to do exactly what Shobhna was doing. Healthcare is an obvious one. But it's not just healthcare services, it's education. 
uh, it's uh, um, you know even agri services, uh, financial services, the range of services where you can start digitally exporting from India around the world. Uh, so you move out from being a services company like the Indian tech sector was to a range of products and digital services and AI driven services. Uh, it's, you know, even today, a large number of the companies are putting all the analytics and AI into India. Now, that's a short step from taking the capacities, putting them together, and creating completely new businesses on the back of that. So, uh, completely aligned to what Shobna was, where Shobna was going with that thought. But, uh, therefore, whether it's manufacturing, what? whether it's digital services, I think the opportunities are very real for the country. You know, I, I just want to build on uh, on the opportunities issue that you spoke of, Piyush, and I completely agree with you. I think that uh, I don't believe that we celebrated entrepreneurship enough in this country, and at least that mindset has started to change specifically in the last 10 years with the emergence of, uh, of a lot of the startups that have now come into play. And, of course, uh, I hope we don't celebrate only valuation, but we celebrate value creation as well. But, Prem Batsa, let's talk about the India opportunity. And, you know, you've been placing your bets on India for the last few years. It started with CSB Bank, ICICI Lombard, Quest Corp, Sunmar, uh, Five Pesa, uh, Digit Insurance. I mean, there's a bunch of companies that you've already invested in. What does the glide path from here look like, given the opportunities that you believe India will continue to enjoy? I, th I think what you said, and I think what you said, there's unlimited opportunity in India. You've got a population of 1.4 billion for the first time. In a long time, you have very business-friendly policies, uh, Shireen. And, um, and with business-friendly policies, you're going to attract, you know, make in India, attract um, uh, uh, foreign investment. What I'd love to see, what I'm so happy to see, is that um, um, Piers talked about 100 unicorns. But the beauty of these unicorns is that whoever has a great idea, Whoever has a great idea, and whatever your caste, your religion, does not make a difference. You've got the opportunity to create a company uh, because of technology, because of India's freedom, and, um, and, and do very well, uh, create a lot of wealth for you. So the opportunity that Piyush talked about, and I talked about, and Shobna mentioned that you had to leave India to, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. Now the opportunity set, Serene, is in India. It's right in India. It's uh, people are coming back. Uh, massive opportunity because of the population and because there's um, as the uh, GDP grows. I'm thinking um, eight to ten percent over a long period of time, and uh, we've got excellent uh, leadership in the in the country. And um, um, I'm just very very positive. Got to learn, and I see it in all the businesses that uh, we've invested in. Um, and I tell uh, people that I um, uh, know that the best country in the world, the best country in the world today is India for investments. Unlimited opportunity. Okay. Uh, if if it is, very... in fact, as you point out, the best country in the world, uh, Prem Batsa, can you put a number to that? Uh, how much are you looking to invest in India over the next five years? So we've invested already about seven billion. And uh, we uh, plan to double that uh, in the next four or five years. Um, you know, we just think it's, it's unlimited opportunity. Uh, very uh, 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 foreign investment is encouraged, is, uh, is attracted to. Uh, Piyush has uh, invested a lot of money. And um, uh, we just think um, uh, it's, um, it's a great place to invest. And, um, and the leadership in the country from the government side, Mr. Modi, I'm a big fan. I think uh, he's uh, done extremely well in the last uh, seven years. By the way, the, for all the people that are uh, watching this, uh, there's a lovely um, a book that was written about Mr. Modi uh, from about 21 perspectives. I know you must have read it, uh, Shireen. Um, why is Mr. Modi so successful uh, over 20 years from uh, Gujarat, 10% economic growth for 13 years, and then um, a majority in, uh, at the national level, and then a bigger majority in 2019. Uh, just a phenomenal book, well worth reading. Um, you know, I would suggest that when you read that book and you see, and I didn't, I thought I knew what Mr. Modi had done, and I didn't uh, till I read that full book. Um, you might come right. to the conclusion that this is one of the, uh, the greatest statesmen that we have. Uh, the, that we have. 
You know, uh, uh, a quick follow-up before I get, I know Piyush is, uh, uh, wants to come in, but, uh, you know, you've been betting on banks, Prem Vatsa, uh, and we've got a banker here on the panel as well. Uh, PSU banks are up for privatization. We don't know when the process will finally take off, but is that going to uh, elicit your participation and interest? Of course, uh, there's all sorts of privatization. A, 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 a major privatization, uh, Shireen, taking place in India today uh, in the uh, order of um, Mrs. Thatcher in the UK. And um, it'll attract a lot of capital from all over the world. And uh, we'll certainly be uh, um, uh, interested ourselves. Piyush, you wanted to make a point? Well, Shireen, I was going to first um, um, echo what Prince said. You know, as we look at our, we're about 20 countries. And without a doubt, India is the most interesting and exciting uh, prospect, um, I think, over this coming decade. Um, and that's because of a lot of the policy reform work that has happened uh, over the last few years. Um, you know, whether it's the GST reform, the, you know, the, the land reform, real estate reform, the bankruptcy code. I mean, each of these things have been kicking in. At the same time, infrastructure, for the first time in my memory, whether it's the ports, the airports, the roads, the railways, uh, all of that is beginning to show up. Uh, as a consequence, the enabling environment to actually make some of uh, the investments work is very much there. As you know, we uh, uh, stepped up and bought one of these bad banks a couple of years ago, Lakshmi Vilas Bank, um, and uh, we're busy in the process of integrating it. Uh, as Prem said, you know, we put in uh, somewhere between two and a half, three billion dollars in the country, uh, and we have uh, the appetite uh, and the wherewithal, obviously, to continue adding more. We're going to uh, continue to grow our book in India. So I think the opportunity space is good, the environment is good, the policy framework is good. I just feel very bullish about the prospects at this uh, point in time. You know, you, you're talking about, both of you interested in banks, you talked about Lakshmi Vilas Bank, perhaps the only bank that's probably going to move on the privatization front, or at least will lead the privatization front, is IDBI Bank. Piyush Gupta and Prem Batsa, is that of interest? Piyush, I'll start by asking you. Well, um, uh, Trin, uh, at this point, no, because I'm a big believer in being able to, uh, you know, swallow and digest what you have. And so we're currently in the throes of trying to make sure uh, we can handle the 600 new branches we got and the whole uh, infrastructure. Uh, and so that's what's occupying our attention right now. But as Trin said, in the goodness of time, uh, we are, you know, we're committed to tripling our franchise in India in the next five years. And we will use every opportunity we get to be able to, you know, uh, expand rapidly. Shireen, uh, you'll expect me to not make any comment on that other than to say that we're excited. <laughs> we're interested in all the opportunities, Shireen. We're looking at everything. And, um, of course, uh, we'll uh, make a, an announcement after the decision, not before. Right. Uh, Shobna, you know, I want to address a separate issue with you, uh, and that really has to do with how we reimagine public-private partnership as we move forward. We're marking 75 years of our independence. The PPP model has worked in some areas, hadn't, hasn't worked in others. As we move forward, what is the role of the private sector in collaboration with the government that you see? Uh, you know, we've seen that work in healthcare in some pockets, in some instances. Well, how do you reimagine PPP as we move forward? It's, it's, uh, uh, Shireen, I think that this is a particular, you know, it's it's each one's experience, which has been, you know, which yeah, we've had a great experience. In fact, our Delhi hospital is a great shining example of PPP in healthcare. But I think that uh, if you move to the courts, there's so many of them where, you know, the PPP uh, have, have had to be adjudicated and for years and years decisions have been taken. Having said that, I think that as president of CII, one of the things that I saw that was developing in this government was actually there was more trust uh, uh, between, the, between the, uh, the private sector and the government and the bureaucracy. And I think that's the crux of it. If we can bring back that trust, because there's... Uh, no one uh, can actually, you know, bring India to that five trillion number just by, you know, the private sector or government. It has to be joint in many, many areas. We need better cities. We need more infrastructure. We do need more jobs more than anything else. And I think diversity. And that will only come when both are playing this together. 
and when the opportunities are there. So while this ease of doing business was, was a huge uh, uh, focus, I think that um, now privatization is added to it. Um, I think in the 75th year, we should not forget that it's all of India and all Indians that make that will make India uh, continue to stay great. So I'm hopeful, but I do think that uh, there's work. It's a work in progress, also. It is a work in progress. And Piyush Gupta, that's what I want to address with you, because I know that you believe that uh, the private sector's capacity uh, is to also shape society in different ways. And I know you have said previously that uh, you believe in doing real things for real people. So as a leader, as you look at what the road ahead looks like, uh, you know, what do you believe businesses and leaders like yourself will need to prioritize and in areas uh, of possible collaboration with the government? So, Shireen, you know, uh, the heart of this thing is uh, the debate between shareholder capitalism and stakeholder capitalism. You know, so what is the true purpose and role of uh, cooperation? Uh, and everybody cites Sir Milton Friedman's famous article which said the only purpose of a company is to make a profit for shareholders. Uh, and obviously the counterpoint to that is that, you know, when you're given life as a legal entity, you inherit some responsibilities to society, to civil society at large and to people. I'm in the second camp, and frankly, I don't think there's too much conflict between what Friedman said and the stakeholder capitalism view. Uh, the question is typically one of time frames. Uh, if you really take the long view and you figure how you're going to be relevant and how you're going to make a return for shareholders over 20, 30, 40 years, then uh, it seems to me you don't have a choice. You've got to be relevant to people, communities, societies, and governments. If you're not, you will not get the license from them to stick around. And therefore, the minute you change your time frame and think long term, the conflict tends to disappear. I think it's instructive that in the last few years uh, around the world, this has obviously become fashionable. This idea of purpose and mission has become fashionable. But I think a lot of uh, global companies and CEOs have actually uh, been able to demonstrate that they're serious about uh, doing things that make a difference. It's not just about squeezing out the next dollar, but being able to be relevant and contribute uh, into societies and communities. So I do think it's beginning to uh, be fashionable. The investor community is looking for, I mean, ESG is the, is the, is the uh, um, you know, well-known acronym that everybody's beginning to look at the role that companies play. So I think there's a much better alignment of interest. I think Shobna nailed it. The real question is the question of trust. So when you get to the stage where governments in the public sector are willing to trust the private sector, recognizing that they have an equal role to play and they have an agenda beyond just profit maximization, you start getting some beautiful outcomes. And I often tell people that one model to consider is the Singapore model. Now, we're a small country. We're, I mean, we're a city, frankly, we're 5 million people. But the Singapore model, which effectively says Temasek, the sovereign fund, uh, owns 50% of the con uh, country, including the 30% stake in our own bank, TBS. But they do not get into the management of any of these companies. They are the shareholder, but they hire professional management, appoint professional boards, and let the private sector get on with the job. Uh, now, the private sector, because of the shareholding construct, is mindful of its role to society at large. It tends to work out quite well. Without the usual interference from politicians and the handicaps that the private sector has, it doesn't uh, you know, handicap the system. Uh, but you get a really good plan of bringing the whole country together. Now, the areas where you can do this are immense. And uh, as you go forward, I think ESG captures it well. I think sustainability is going to be big. And there is no way governments alone are going to be able to solve whether it's the climate challenge or the biodiversity challenge. You know, the, the movers and shakers of capital in the world have got to come to the party. Uh, similarly, the S of ESG, being able to think about uh, inclusion at scale, the social ramifications of the bottom of the pyramid, uh, the main actors in the world are private sector actors. They've got to have a meaningful role to play working alongside the public sector and the government. But uh, today, digital, technology, AI gives us all the opportunity to solve the naughty problems of the world. So if, if governments and private sector come together, you can do a lot of things that weren't possible 15 years ago. Yeah, that's right. And, and as you point out, we need all the movers and shakers to come to the party and be at the table. And Prem Vatsa, in that context, how are you realigning your investment strategy or investment philosophy to cater to some of those issues that Piyush talked about? Uh, you know, the ESG goals that have been set out by different corporations. Uh, how are you realigning your priorities in light of this? You know, uh, uh, Shireen, right from inception, we always wanted to build a good company, a company that provides outstanding service to our uh, customers, look after the employees who provide that service, 
um, learn, yeah, make a profit. You have to make a profit, otherwise you're not going to be in business for long. And then um, look after, uh, donate to the communities you do business. So we've done that for 37 years. And as Piyush says, that's the number one way of building a good business, especially a long-term business. And if you're building a long-term business, which we're planning to do uh, long after I'm gone, the next 100 years, then you have to um, um, uh, focus on all of those uh, constituencies. May I just say uh, on the side, uh, and so culture is very important, um, uh, Shireen, and you build a culture over time, takes a lot of time. And I'm, uh, of course, uh, biased, but I'm uh, quite excited about uh, our culture, a culture of treating well, treating people well, a culture uh, that follows the golden rule, treat your neighbor like you want to be treated yourself in for your customers, your employees, your community, all over the place, You'd, of, of course, your shareholders. Uh, may I just um, go uh, on a side when in terms of public-private partnerships, uh, we have the Bangalore International Airport. We own 54% of it. And I must tell you, it's an amazing success story. The second terminal will be opening in October. And I'd wager, with the exception of um, Singapore, that um, there is no airport this uh, terminal that's being um, opened, there's no terminal like the uh, 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 second terminal that's being built. Private enterprise at its best with partnership with the, uh, uh, the government of India and uh, the local uh, Karnataka government. And um, uh, it's just an amazing story. And you'll see it when it opens in October um, um, uh, in front of you. I've seen airports all over North America and, and many parts of the world. And uh, I haven't seen one like this. I had a tour about a month ago. The low bar frame. Well, uh, you know, we. Uh, yes, Piyush, you, you were saying? I just uh, pulling frames like I said, America is a very low bar. <laughs> yes, when it comes to uh, airport we're, infrastructure, we're, we're, uh, I, 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 I would, I would have to, I would have to agree. I would have to agree. But you know, Shobhna, since we're talking about culture, uh, and both Piyush and Prem alluded to that, the culture of collaboration, the culture of innovation. Uh, I have to say, I, I'm not a big fan of Jugard. Yes, it teaches you to be resilient and adapt to the situation as it arises. But I think we need to build on a culture of excellence as well. So in that context, Shobhna, I want to understand from you, uh, you know, especially when we talk about taking Indian brands global, let's be very honest, we're still very, very small percentage of global trade uh, as of today. So what needs to happen? What needs to change? What needs to be prioritized to ensure that we get a larger share of global trade? One is that uh, the opportunity. So we did miss uh, we did miss the 80s and the 90s when manufacturing took off in China. You know, India and China almost had the same GDP. And I think that the country was encouraged to open. We missed some of the uh, global, you know, the medical tourism when, because Thailand just did it. Now I think that the real opportunity here is, uh, is there for countries like India because one is that uh, people are understanding that there's a, Huge open, uh, that, that there's a huge pool of, uh, of, of engineers. And I think that the world needs a lot of engineering talent at this time in, in many, many sectors. So, so we're seeing a resurgence of that coming in. We're seeing a resurgence of manufacturing. And, and this is not your same vanilla manufacturing that has come to the table here. We have, if you, even if you look at some of the entrepreneurs, that have set up world-class plants like, uh, they, like the uh, like the Reliance plant. It can take any crude in the world. If you talk about what Prem said, world-class airports, not just in Bangalore, but in almost every city. So if you look at manufacturing of auto, auto components, here we're making a mark again, both for export and for the for our internal demand. And I think that each one of these sectors that what we've learned from missing the bus at that time was that quality was super important. And, and I think Indians didn't hesitate to go out and forge some critical partnerships when it was required, whether with, it's with the Japanese, with the Koreans. And, and if you look at the way that 5G is coming, we, we have the cheapest data in the world, the cheapest, uh, but, but the best networks. And I think all this will bring to bear that, that in, in a situation that 
you know, of course, in India, it's still tough to do business. It's still tough to bring scale. But when you see that the opportunity that you need an alternative, I think that India is truly an alternate country. And using that opportunity, we will have a chip manufacturing. We will have greater scale. And, and we're seeing that, whether it's the PLI, whether it's the government's thrust to make sure that, you know, we make an India for India, for the world. I think everyone is starting to talk the same language. And when we do so, it's not just services, but it's definitely manufacturing. That if you ask me at any time whether there was the opportunity that's right, I would say in the 75th year, this is one of the things that I would be most hopeful about, that, that we can really be very, very vital to the world. Well, uh, we hope that we will be very, very vital to the world. But Piyush, that's exactly what I want to uh, raise with you. You know, you talked about the opportunity as well as the challenge of the geopolitical tensions that we're currently uh, seeing in different parts of the world. At the same time, there's also the rise of nationalism. You talked about digitization and its advantages uh, in the hope that we're in a boundary-less world. But we're not really, uh, as we see more and more governments and policies uh, taking a much more insular and an inward approach so as a leader today as a CEO how challenging is it is it for you to navigate a world where you have geopolitical tensions as well as the rise of nationalism at the same time well I, I wouldn't deny it is a, a trickier world but Shireen I'm a bit of a contrarian uh, first of all I, I don't subscribe to the theory of deglobalization I think some of the fundamentals uh, information flows data flows technology flows are just too far gone to reverse. Frankly, uh, even between China and the US, uh, I say it's not just uh, you know self, uh, 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 um, you know, a two-way reliance. It's actually a fused world. Uh, it's just very, very hard to unbundle today. And so while yes, people are circling the wagons, I'm, it's not clear to me this is going to be a, a long-term trend. Uh, in a very uh, strange way, I actually think the pandemic the last two years is going to accelerate globalization, not deglobalization in a very important way. And that is just globalization of talent. People have figured that it's, it's okay to work from anywhere. And the minute you say you can work from anywhere, then you could be working from Baltimore or Bangalore, it doesn't matter. And I think that the fact that work can happen anywhere and work uh, uh, can move smoothly, uh, I think that's going to precipitate even more globalization in times to come. So I think we're just going through a short cycle. Over time, it will reverse. Now, in that context, I think India does have a couple of uh, important things going for uh, for the country. Number one is we built a reputation as a technology powerhouse. Like I said before, it's you know the Infosys and NCS and TCS. It's the services sector more than product, but nevertheless we're known for technology. And in a digitizing world, in a world of AI, in a world of blockchain, solutions uh, that come from India will get a credibility. So I think that's something that we can leverage on as we look at expanding outside of our, uh, our borders. The other plus point we have is something Shobhna said, our price point. You know, today we're still very, very competitive. The, you know, the two rupee toothpaste or the, or the low value item, which is really relevant for large parts of the world, not just the South, but increasingly even the North. Uh, people are, you know, looking at cutting back consumption patterns or looking for uh, this thing. India is very well positioned for that. Uh, building global brands is not easy. It's not going to happen overnight. Even the Chinese, frankly, even the Japanese and Koreans took 20, 30 years to get there. Uh, nevertheless, I do think that those two pillars are pillars on the back of which we can build. Yes, uh, absolutely. That is clearly uh, the advantage that we have. And you're right in pointing out that the pandemic has, in fact, encouraged and accelerated the globalization of talent. Uh, Prem Bhats, I want to understand from you, uh, you know, your playbook uh, as a leader, how that's changed over the last 50 years and what do you now intend to focus much more on and the role that you believe that the Indian diaspora can play uh, as we mark this important milestone? So, uh, Shireen, first of all, uh, I agree fully with uh, all the points that Piyush made. I um, understand that uh, we have uh, began in Canada, just a Canadian company, expanded, as you think, in the United States, and now we're all over the world. We're global. I think uh, Piyush is exactly right. It's a global world. Um, you know, you'll have these ups and downs, China, United States, and other uh, countries. Um, uh, we've had that, you know, if you look at the history of the world in the last 50 years, we've 
I myself have experienced all the ups and downs. And so we'll go work our way through it. Uh, but I don't think it changes the fact that uh, um, it's a global world. Uh, all the AI and data and technology that um, um, uh, Piyush is talking about. And uh, the Indian diaspora is just um, a, a fantastic uh, opportunity for us to work together, always uh, in the interest of our own company. Um, but, um, but it's uh, so nice to be able to uh, talk to other Indian CEOs. Um, and uh, as I said before, um, um, uh, Shireen, it's culture, good business. Do good business for the long term, you'll benefit. Do business for the long term, you will benefit. And that's clearly been your philosophy, hasn't it, uh, uh, Prem Batsa? No wonder you're called uh, the Warren Buffett with Indian origins. But uh, uh, Prem, you know, uh, Warren Buffett, clearly uh, one of the icons that you have shaped and modeled your career on. As you look at CEOs of Indian origin today who are heading global corporations, anyone in particular that stands up? Well, I, uh, Shireen, I got to tell you, the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, uh, MasterCard, Ajay Banga, Adobe, Shatanu Narayanan, and myself, we had one commonality. We all went to the same school, Hyderabad Public School in, uh, uh, in India, in Hyderabad. And my dad was long passed away now, but my dad was the principal of that school. He was vice principal and he was a teacher. And uh, he ended his career by being um, the principal of that school. So I have a bias to those CEOs. Well, you know, <laughs> and uh, you're absolutely right in pointing out the Hyderabad Public School has has been has been the playground uh, for for uh, uh, a lot of global CEOs who are leading global corporations. So uh, so kudos to to your father uh, for having uh, having created that uh, uh, that environment for people to flourish in. Uh, Shobna. Uh, your playbook and uh, what are you going to be changing, if anything at all, and who do you uh, look up to at this point in time uh, of the global CEOs that we've been talking about? Hey, uh, definitely uh, the ones that Prem spoke about because I kind of know them and my husband went to HPS so, and, and I lived here. So I think that's a, a great, um, you know, what Satya has done definitely has, uh, has, has really reinvigorated uh, a company that most people thought uh, had reached its pinnacle. And I think that kind of difference that when you can do that to mature companies really shows great vision and foresight. And, and that's something that uh, people like Prem and, and Ajay, who I serve on the Edison Alliance board with, I've seen that in many of the CEOs, but they, and I've seen that in my dad, so if you ask me, uh, you know, who I admire, definitely all of them. My own playbook, I think that really comes from something that we learned during, uh, that got reinforced during COVID was that uh, it's really about the trust that people have in you. And if you can, uh, you, we, you know, we need to, to keep that trust uh, requires great sacrifice and doing things right. But when you when you make it happen, I really think that that's when the real good of uh, of um, not just humanity but a, but uh, a healthcare enterprise really comes through. So that's something that uh, we all are super doubling down on. That um, it's the value system and and the trust that we've been able to keep and earn during the toughest of times. Yeah. Yeah. Piyush Gupta. Uh your playbook, leadership playbook, and what do you miss the most, uh, you know, of not being in India? Cricket, Bollywood, what is it that you miss the most? Actually, they often say Singapore is the best country, best uh, city in India, so you don't wind up missing too much. We get more Indian theatre, Indian Bollywood and Indian cricket than you uh, probably get in most cities in India. Uh, obviously, you miss, uh, you know, the, the energy level uh, of the country, and that's obviously, uh, you know, you, you, you don't have that everywhere. Uh, but as you know, businesses in India are a lot, so th those bring me back quite frequently, uh, and so that works. So in terms of playbook, um, you know, I, I have to say that uh, I think we're at a really important um, uh, point in human history. I think technology is going to be a game changer. It already has been, if you look at the last 15 years, the mobile phone, the internet, web 2, social media, etc. But I don't think we've seen anything yet. 
uh, the power of AI, artificial general intelligence, and the power of blockchain technologies to reshape the back office of the world, the institutions and infrastructure we know, uh, that's on us. And frankly, when you layer that on with uh, you know graphics and 5G or you know, virtual realities and metaverse, I think things are going to be very different in uh, 10 years. Uh, and so you have to cater and make sure that you're adapting for a new world. Uh, the fundamentals don't change. I'm in the same camp as uh, the other panelists. You know, culture is important. That obviously uh, beats uh, each strategy for breakfast, as Dr. said. I think value systems are important. Uh, but how you manage a company is different. You can't manage it in the old way. Weber's hierarchy and, you know, the middle management and less. Uh, you can't be nimble and adaptive if you continue to manage the company that way. You've got to manage horizontally. You've got to manage in a very different way. Uh, and you've got to be able to react to this uh, massive change of technology that is around you. Uh, so your playbook has got to adapt to that. Your playbook also has to adapt to the sustainability questions we spoke about earlier. I do think that your role in society and your willingness to grapple with the problem of ESG will be big challenges, but at the same time, it's going to be a trillion dollar opportunity. So if you can adapt to that opportunity, if you can adapt to the technology, uh, you can come out ahead. Prem Matsa, you wanted to uh, get in the, the final word before we close. Well, I think, uh, Shireen, uh, congratulations on having such a nice uh, um, uh, program with uh, Piyush and um, uh, Shobana, and I'm very happy to join you. And I think if I can uh, end by saying that India, the next 10 years are going to be dramatic. It is the best place to invest all of your uh, um, audience uh, and the people uh, abroad. It's a wonderful country to invest, tremendous talent, all the things that we talked about, and um, uh, I, for one, are very excited. Well, uh, we share your excitement, Piyush Premvatsa, Shobna Kamineni. Thank you very much for joining us here on the Global Dialogue to take us through the distance covered, but more importantly, what the journey ahead looks like. We appreciate your time and we wish you all the very best of luck. That's it then on this special edition of Global Dialogues. There is a lot more coming up here on CNBC TV 18. Don't go anywhere. We're back in a moment with more.